The format of this audiovisual essay is not the usual kind. We want to summarize Roland Barthes' essay, The Death of the Author. But the point of the essay is that there is no Roland Barthes, and there is no essay either. So instead, we're trying to recreate his argument in our own language. To us, the heart of Barthes' argument is that there is no absolute notion of the author for any given work. Our vision of the writer is almost always one built by society, and we don't know how accurate or inaccurate that vision is. Barthes challenges us to stop using the concept of the author in our criticisms and instead engage with the ideas we build out of the art. As an example, what does the author Balzac mean with the following passage? She was a true woman with her sudden terrors, her unreasoning caprices, her instinctive worries, her causeless audacity her bravado, and her fascinating delicacy of feeling. From Sarrazine by Balzac. This is a classic sexist attitude. From whom does it come? Does Balzac see these qualities as inherently feminine? Is Balzac identifying these qualities with literary femininity as a commentary about the practice of literature in his day? Is this solely the opinion of the protagonist? Is it supposed to be an observation about femininity? in 19th century France. Let's perform a genealogy on storytelling. In almost all technologically primitive societies, myth-making and storytelling are done by shamans. Here language works against us. Strictly speaking, the terms of shaman and shamanism should only apply to cultural practices in and around Mongolia. We must clarify our terms. By shamanism, I mean any practice of revealed truth by contact with spirits. This can be done, for example, through trances, dreams, drugs, or visions. This is almost universal among technologically primitive societies. Numerous Australian Aborigine groups did this. Numerous groups in the Amazon rainforest did this. The Greek oracles, French spiritism, Moses' vision of a burning bush, and the witch's Sabbath. This is not only restricted to technologically primitive societies. Monasticism of all kinds can be viewed as shamanism as can evangelical glossolalia. The point is that in shamanism, the story is considered as being outside the speaker. They are conveying something universal. They are a messenger. The idea of the author being relevant to the content is an essentially modern idea, one belonging to the philosophical lineage of empiricism, positivism, and in Barthes' estimation, capitalism. Why should we feel tied to this way of understanding? Many of the greatest pieces of art, things that we consider classic, challenged the very definition of the medium. Mayarmé's poetry was based more on the auditory experience than on the written form. Proust's book induces the reader to reminisce about the narrator's past, rather than the traditional narrative story or stream of consciousness. Grammar gives us insight. Sentences need subject, verb, object, but they don't need to refer to any people whatsoever. For the most part, readers do not know the authors. They have preconceptions before they start the book, but the way we think about the author changes as we read the text. There is no constant author to speak of. The art of literature is an experience of reading, and as the listener or reader, we have a hand in creating it. The story is an artificial paradise of our own making, a mental hanging gardens of Babylon. Life can only imitate the book and the book itself is only a tissue of signs, a lost, infinitely remote imitation. The most primitive form of criticism is to draw connections between the author's life and the work itself. The identification of the author is the end of the text's meaning to this type of criticism. Once we realize that there is no author, much less an author's background, we stop limiting our experiences with the work. By refusing to stop creating meaning with respect to the author, we obtain a radical freedom the freedom to explore the text in a myriad of ways. Back to the passage from Balzac, it comes from the reader. The writing is not important, the reader is important. The reader is creating a universe in their head and synthesizing the work in a unique way. The Greek tragedy was called a tragedy because many of the words spoken had multiple meanings, and the characters constantly misunderstood each other to their mutual downfall. Our words have multiple meanings too, and the person who understands them all is the reader. Classical literature is interested in the writer because all people in literature are writers. But to quote a wise man, the birth of the reader must be ransomed by the death of the author. Hey, I'm Dan, and I have Joe here with me. 
we wanted to do a quick discussion of what we are personally taking away from this essay. So, uh, I, I suppose one thing that I was taking away from this essay is the idea that um, focusing on the author leads to an uninteresting discussion. Um, for instance, so many people, they always talk about, uh, they always ask this question about Quentin Tarantino. They're like, oh, well, Quentin Tarantino, does he, uh, does he have a, a foot fetish? You know, we, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's pretty cut and dry, yes. <laughs> but the interesting thing is that if you actually look at his body of work, you know, for instance, um, there's a very provocative scene in the movie From Dusk Till Dawn, right? And I, I don't think he's, he's not the director of that movie, but in that movie, he plays a character, and that character... He also has a foot fetish. And that character, though, is is known for not really paying attention to the implications of his actions. Because there's a younger woman who, also in the story, that while he has Selma Hayek, he has this, you know, a very interesting scene with Selma Hayek, earlier in, in this same movie, he's lusting after a younger woman's feet, too. And his character ends up paying a price for having this very short-term uh, view of their priorities in life. And so, so there's that distinction, but also in a, movie, in a movie that Quentin Tarantino has actually directed personally, um, Kill Bill, you see there are a lot of scenes where... He focuses on or the... Uma ma- Thurman is barefoot. It's sort of the camera's following her feet. Or there's the... I think the most famous scene from that, if you're talking about Quentin Tarantino's foot fetish, uh, is the wiggle your big toe mm-hmm. moment in the truck when she's just uh, woken up from her coma and she's trying to regain her life, trying to regain self-determination. Uh, exactly, yeah. Because she, she explores her past memories and kind of what has gotten her up to this point while she's in the back of that car trying to gain um, control of her own body, her own faculties again. And there's that whole scene. She's just, it's zooming in on her toes, you know. But that, if uh, it's also when, when they focus on her feet, like as a transitionary sort of measure, um, when they shift from one scene to another, they'll also focus on her feet. So you'll have a, a shot that pans from her feet to her up up to her torso as she's walking to her next destination in as a part of the story and he borrowed that shot from one of his favorite western movies the good the bad and the ugly because they do a very similar shot where it focuses on clint eastwood's feet as he's walking somewhere and interesting and i I don't remember that but i've only seen it once i think it's, it's kind of a common uh, shot that they'll do in, yeah. a, in, in a few westerns, especially when, when they're getting ready to draw and you have two gunslingers that are about to shoot each other. They'll do a shot where they're looking at one gunslinger. Oh, from where the, the per- camera's very low to the ground. It's sort of exactly. pointing upward. Exactly. Though it's, and so to me, it, it's, it's a technique to show a character's determination or, you know, um, that they're facing a challenge right now. Or they're on the next leg of their journey, um, <laughs> uh, but it's so. So it's an inter- interesting question to ask. Hey, does this author have a foot fetish? But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter that the author has a foot fetish because if you really look at it within the work, you really see that um, that as a technique of storytelling, it really adds a lot to their art. So, so that, that's kind of, that was the immediate example after reading The Death of the Author. That's, that's what I took away from it. I, I immediately thought of it in a, in a popular art kind of fashion Mm -hmm. and, um, and how people kind of let these salacious details kind of like run their opinions of things when it doesn't really matter, you know, what, what. Right, right. And I, you know, this discussion, is more interesting than the question of whether 
Quentin Tarantino is some sort of sex pervert. Like, okay, say he is. And it, I mean, I think he's stated publicly that he has a foot fetish. So what? Right. I don't really care mm-hmm. about him <laughs> all that much. Um, a, a much more interesting question to me is, is there some sort of thematic consistency between films? What are the feet or what are the toes representing to him? Are they agency, um, power, self-determination, liberty? You know, I mean, and, I'm, and, I'm just spitballing here, but and, and but that's a lot could more. Be something to it. That's a lot more interesting discussion than whether the than whether the artist has this this preference anyway, because his preference in the bedroom doesn't really affect you or me in our day to day lives. It does, before I even really thought about it. It didn't really even occur to me but while I was watching his works, because I'm, you know, I'm a fan of his work, but it's, it wasn't really something that really affected um, the story until, you know, uh, and then, or until I noticed all these other people talking about it, but it it still, to this day, doesn't affect my, my quality of, of the enjoyment, so, um, what, the, the problem that I usually see is that in the classroom, um, because I think you right. and me have both worked in in the classroom setting before. The issue is that in the middle of dis- of a discussion, you'll have a student that will bring up a personal anecdote of an author. Um, for instance, uh, in college there was this author, and he wrote a, a book that was set in the American South, and of of course it just so happened that the author himself was from the American South and and so it was it was one of those things where the student kind of brought it up and the teacher um dismissed it right yeah kind of dismissed it as as not not the most important thing um because it's you know what did it add to dis- to the discussion not much because the environment didn't add too much to the story because the story what makes a story engaging isn't always the setting it's the character arc it's what what kind of character do we have at the beginning what kind of challenges does the character face and then at the end of the story how is the character changed because of those challenges that's the import that's really the meat of the story but when all you're talking about is window dressing that doesn't add a lot you know yeah, um, so I, I don't have much of a humanities kind of background. I, so I have a math background, and one of the examples I thought of is Oswald Teichmuller, who is a German mathematician. There's actually a whole subfield of mathematics named after him, Teichmuller theory. Uh, but he was a Nazi, and it's not he was sort of a casual Nazi. He went out of his way to sign up uh, for the army, despite being in his 40s. He was not at risk of being drafted. He died on the Eastern Front. Um, not, you know, a bad person, I think, by most standards. But does that affect his mathematics? Does that affect his his work there? And no, not really. Um, now, the politics of Nazism did affect academia in numerous ways. Uh, but his personal attitudes don't really directly have any bearing on Teichmuller theory, on this study of complex manifolds, which is technical <laughs> jargon. I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it, in in our graduate student lounge, we'd sort of make jokes about these people, but at the end of the day, we're just sort of talking shop. We're just using some humor. Uh, it doesn't... That, that's all it is. It's not a deep, meaningful discussion. You're not learning about their work. In a meaningful way. Yeah, their their background doesn't really have much to say about their contribution to society. Right, um, and, and that's not something that would come up in the classroom if you're taking a course on Teichmuller theory. You wouldn't ask the professor, oh, this guy, is this true that he was a Nazi, that he was, you know, very, um, very Nazi-ish? I don't, <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. I mean, he, you know. Because it, it doesn't affect the 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 math itself the math is, the math stands you know on on its own it seems yeah exactly 
Mm. Uh, and I think it's there's there's parallels with art and with literature in that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, sometimes it, it 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 does seem really important to uh, like it, it helps you with un, with understanding the work to kind of ignore the the fabricator of the art. Um, one really important example that came up was that again in college we had an author visit our our um, our campus. And the author had written this book that everyone was supposed to read. And in the book, the author uses red as a, as a way to kind of show uh, uh, as a symbol for change. So there's three very important scenes where the author talks about the red of the sunset. And it makes the character have a very, you know, self-reflecting moment. Then there's a dream sequence where he has these red cardinals that fly around him and fly inside of him or fly out of him, something like that. And then at the end of the book, um, there's a, a confrontation and somebody's bleeding and the author again mentions that red, you know, the red of his blood in the, in that, in that, uh, part of the story. So... During our discussion with the author, where a whole bunch of students came and, you know, almost all the English department was there, uh, carrying carrying some weight, of course. <laughs> but they How many of the students read the book? Uh, it was like a good, like, I want to say 5 to 10% versus like 90, 95% split. <laughs> like... <laughs> You could tell that there were there were some people that showed up that were just there because they got some extra credit points for being there, but but the discussion that we had with the author was really illuminating because um, one of the students raised their hand and talked about these three times that he invoked red as a symbol for a agency of, of change, and what ended up happening is that. The student talked about these three things that happened, and then are these three specific scenes in the book, and the author looked bewildered and literally blurted out loud, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> and so when we got back to the classroom, the you know, the next day we had an in-class discussion about it. And one of the students brought that up in the in the class discussion, and they were like, "Teacher, what do you what do you think about that? You know, you're a professor. You've been teaching literature for years and years and years. Have you ever seen or heard anything like that happening?" And the teacher poignantly looked up from his desk, put his glasses down, and just said, "The author's an idiot. <laughs> Ignore the author." And I don't, I don't think we were at the point where we really had read like the death of the author. The death of the author seems like more of a philosophical um, treatise instead of something that you treatise. Re- treatise. See, that's yeah. I, I'll, I'll pronounce it my way. Uh, <laughs> treatise. Hey, that sounds. That sounds... these authors are idiots too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, but it was interesting to, though, just to see how the author didn't realize what he was creating as he was creating it um for lack of a better way to express that i guess um it it was just really interesting to see how my how my teacher um just didn't even blink an eye and he he just said you have to ignore the author sometimes you you get a lot more out of the work sometimes if you just don't bother with the author because the author they might not realize the significance of their own of of their own story sometimes um right right um to me one of the things i really got out of this essay is is reinforcing my opinion that art is essentially intellectual play um and it's supposed to be fun it's supposed to be enriching to ourselves and so if you're constantly worrying about the intentions of the author, that's taking away from that. Now, I, I'm, I'm not as extreme as uh, Roland Barthes on this. I don't think you should never consider the author. You should never consider 
their intentions. But you should feel free to ignore them. You should feel free to make meaning however you want. Uh, it doesn't hurt anyone. I mean, maybe... I Okay, I shouldn't make such bold claims. Maybe you can figure out how to hurt people by, <laughs> by making weird readings of stuff. I don't know. But, I, yeah, it, art is intellectual play. Don't worry about it. The author doesn't matter. You don't know them. You don't know their life. Right? At best, you have some preconceptions based on maybe the news or uh, secondhand rumors, like I've told about uh, Teichmuller. <laughs> You have no idea if I'm lying. I mean, you can go look it up and verify it. Well, I, I think sometimes, though, like, the author... Uh, one thing that kind of would come up in, in the classroom sometimes was, like, for instance, a, a student would mention, oh, well, this author is from the South, and they're writing about the South, right? And And so, because, like, of course, we would acknowledge that as, like, yeah, the author's doing that. Um, but, but it's, it's an important idea, I think, in, at least in writing, you should write what you know. And so it's, it goes, I, maybe this goes back to the idea of, um, of like, you know, you should have a genuine, a, a little bit of art should be, you know, genuine. We see that a lot in, like, rap, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. and hip hop these days is that the idea of, like, of an artist, that isn't being true to themselves or maybe they're talking about the about how hard it was growing up in the streets and then it turns out years later that they never even you know like drake for instance talked about how i mean how, he, he how, got shot put in a wheelchair <laughs> but just he, because it was on degrassi <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't matter I mean. but but he he in his art though he talked um he talked about how it is in the streets but then mm -hmm. he grew up in the suburbs so he never really knew the struggle that that um, a lot of artists from the inner city have had to deal with, um, and he's he got like really uh, panned for that by a lot of critics and other artists. A lot of other artists have found it really hard to respect um, respect Drake after it came out that he was kind of uh, fronting, you know, about his mm -hmm. past and essentially lying about about uh where he came from and uh and so i i think a, like a lot of artists they use that foundation of of what they know to kind of create a story that is believable but once the symbolism and the art and sometimes once they start getting going the story can kind of become greater than themselves mm -hmm. um there's that part of roland barth's uh where he talks about shamanism and how sometimes you're just, sometimes you're a conduit for something greater than yourself. Um, and I think that's where, you know, our, our discussion might start getting into, like, intentionality and meaning. Uh, we, we've already kind of been talking about it, I think, um, a bit. But, yeah, um, and I think your example with the color red in this um, this author's book is a great example of that. It's, and it, ultimately this is a question about um symbolism or, or more specifically like semiotics and where does meaning exist well most people say yes let's just go with that otherwise <laughs> the discussion becomes really difficult <laughs> yeah. um it, okay so let's say meaning exists now does the meaning of a message is that the message sender or the message receiver who's constructing that meaning um and i think I, I think the more you stare at this, the more you think about it, the more you have to come to the conclusion that the listener is really constructing the meaning. Um, and it's very much in line with the death of the author here, because it's explicitly saying, you are the reader, you're creating this world for yourself. Do it however you want, you know, enjoy it. Um, and make this make this as rich as you can. Mm. Kind of, kind of your your personal takeaway is more important than any sort of uh, than any sort of specific thing that the author might be trying right. trying to sh you know maybe shove in your face or that or even the author's trying to do. Yeah. Well, I think in practical terms, you can almost never really know certain with with certainty um, other people's intentions. Mm -hmm. You can 
if you know them very well, you might have some very educated guesses, right? Um, but especially if you don't know them at all, like we do not know Quentin Tarantino, mm-hmm. uh, at, at best we're guessing, right? We're sort of grasping in the dark. Is that the phrase? Well, that's what it feels like sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, well, when when you're when you're guessing at at the at the artist's meaning, um, I think you're. It goes back to that idea of. Like you're you're letting somebody else tell you how to feel about the story when your feelings are just as are just as um, important as the as as whatever the author might be trying to say with the story, like specifically. But um, yeah, I mean, yeah, and and let me add one thing. Um, so I've I've heard this term in some discussions of writing. So. There's sort of two classes of writers, as they like to separate them. There are planners, people who plan everything out. They think very carefully about every word they write down, in, in theory. And and that would be... Um, well, and, I'll, I'll and then the that. other category are called pantsers. And they're people who are going by the seat of their pants. Hence the name. They're not pantsing people. <laughs> mm-hmm. Confusing name, perhaps. Um, and, you know, but the reality is no one is... is a pure pantser no one's a pure planner you know every artist has asked has both of these aspects to them um you know even someone like cormac mccarthy i'm sure is is uh introduced to new readings of his work that he had not thought of and i to my understanding he's a very much he's a very detailed planner mm. right but he's still not perfect about it still yeah and i've heard that uh even like somebody like uh stephen king who's like a prolific writer um i i i thought there was something that i read where he said that you know in the moment when you're writing something will just click and sometimes you might have things like maybe that 60 80 percent planned out what you want to do with the story but sometimes in the moment something else comes up and you just you go with it, you know? And, uh, and so I, I always thought that was kind of a cool thing because for instance, you have like, um, I always think of the, uh, Tolkien, uh, who made the, like the Hobbit and things like that. Right. J.R.R. Tolkien. And he, I mean, he really went out of his way to create the language and was very nuts and bolts about his understanding of his own universe. Um, but then you have somebody like, uh, the author J.K. Rowling, who, from what I understand, she she would plan some of it, but sometimes in the moment, she, just something would strike her, and she would be inspired, and she would just write her story out on like little bits of paper that whatever she could find, wherever she could find it, she would just start scrawling little pieces of something down, and so like so I think sometimes you, you do get inspired, and that all that inspiration and that that synthesis you know um well i i was an english major in school and i would always ask after, especially after i declared my major i would ask my english professor what am i going to do with this and he would sometimes say the power of english um of literature is synthesis you know and when you're bridging the gaps when you're bridging the gaps between all these different ideas um Sometimes that is where the meaning can come from. And, you know, maybe nobody ever thought to put these different elements together in this different way before. And that, you just created something new. Or you helped illuminate something for a potential reader that they otherwise never would have thought about it like that. And, you know, so it's... it's uh, I, I've always thought about that in the back of my mind. Just that idea of, you know, putting together different things and... And just kind of like in the moment, something amazing can happen. But you have to be open to it, and you gotta you gotta be okay with exploring, you know, these these different concepts in new and unfamiliar ways. Mm-hmm. But sometimes that's how you write a multi million dollar novel <laughs> series, and, and sometimes that's how you ruin your career via Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh, <laughs> that poor poor James Gunn. He 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 had a really good deal until they found out that he made a bunch of inappropriate jokes. 
Um, well, or, yeah, I don't know if it's group. that they found out, but it was popularized. Yeah. Uh, or the, the knowledge or the fact that he had made these jokes was popularized. Um, yeah. But, but I wasn't I, even thinking of him, uh, you know. But, I mean, Twitter in general seems to be a way for for brilliant people <laughs> to just destroy their careers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I think it's some that anytime you have too much of a knee-jerk reaction, it's going to lead to problems. And, and I think that's where an editor can come, you know, editors yeah. come into play. They kind of help rein some of that in. <laughs> yeah. But... Well, I think what you're saying with, um, you know, sometimes the, the inspiration just strikes you and you have to go with it. It's just, the, there's so much more to the human brain uh, than you can sort of easily access consciously. And I think just subconsciously you're picking up a lot, on a lot of stuff and part of being an artist, uh, or and not even just an artist, but, you know, probably being a great engineer or being a definitely being a great mathematician is learning how to pick up on that subconscious that subconscious twinge and to follow that mm -hmm. it it almost reminds me of a, of like uh because one of my friends he's he really loves like music and he had this interesting insight one day where he said like um i don't know how to how to write a good song sometimes but i know a good song when i hear it and it's just one of those things that it's it like it really um, you don't know what you have until it until it exists sometimes, and um, and it, and that's that's why I just always keep coming back to the idea that sometimes you create something greater than yourself, and you're just I I, I liked that idea of of being a conduit to something mm -hmm. to something else, um, and it definitely does show like the the human mind has has a ton of really amazing mysteries still kind of lying in it so yeah but but i guess I, that seems like a good place for us to end is it is yeah it i think i think we've said a lot oh, yeah a lot we... of ums and ahs <laughs> <laughs> but uh i can't think of anything else i really want to add i feel like i got my points out yeah that, that's what we get for being human thanks for listening and check out our other videos like comment or subscribe if you want more content similar to this Tune in next time when we analyze the neo-traditional, postmodern, hyper-surrealist rhetoric of Little Nicky.